which has really ravaged the world and brought the incredible changes that we see all over the place. Now just consider this for a minute. This is a little virology for you. Size matters, or does it, when it comes to power and authority? Well, one would ask the question. Size Matters was the famous logo that went with the Renault Clio advert from the late 1990s. doesn't seem to matter so much as you might think. That little white line at the bottom of the screen there, that represents 100 nanometers. Now, some of you will be thinking, what on earth is a nanometer? Well, it's not very big. If you imagine a meter, there are 1,000 millimeters in a meter. And there are 1,000 microns in a millimeter. Well, there are 1,000 nanometers in a micron. In other words, a billion nanometers, 1,000 million nanometers in a meter, in three feet. So that little distance there, the 100 nanometers as shown on the slide, is actually a tenth of a micron. Now, if you think about it this way, take a human hair. For those of you that still have human hair, if you have a human hair, it's 750,000 nanometers across. So in relative terms to the size of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it's about 750 times the diameter of the virus. This is a tiny thing, and yet the power it wields is amazing. You just have to look at these mortality curves that we're presented with on a regular basis, and you can see the effect. Now, it clearly has power. Is its power, is its authority legitimate? Well, we can discuss that in the breakout a little bit later. But let me deliberately take you now to another arena where power and authority came head to head. And the image that you see there on the screen is an image deliberately out of focus of a Middle Eastern city. And you'll probably recognize it as I slowly bring it into focus. But I just want you to think about the really difficult questions of life, not the trivial stuff that fills our radio shows and Radio 5 Live and all the sort of trivial stuff that is presented to us day by day in the media, but the things that we find so difficult to really grapple with. And so often we just put these difficult questions to the back of our minds. You know, we put them in the too difficult pile, we consign them to an occasion when we might have more time and we'll maybe come back to them or just not now. It's too difficult. And yet that's not a very satisfactory solution. And one of these questions might be, well, is there actually genuinely a higher power? Is there some authority, some transcendent authority I need to recognize? Now, People have a vague idea about ultimate reality, about what really matters in life, about where we came from and what we're here for and what's it all about. And it seems almost beyond us, and yet the great thinkers of our day have struggled with some of these questions. And to be honest, they've often failed to come up with any kind of convincing answers. I recognize, for example, that the universe calls for an explanation. Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, wrote about this in his book, The Grand Design, and utterly failed to provide a convincing, or indeed even a coherent account of the origin of our universe. The reality is that the evidence all points to the universe having a beginning, and if it has a beginning, it must have a cause. And if it has a cause, that cause must be separate from and different to the physical universe that exists. It must be not material, but immaterial. Therefore, there must be a higher authority, and it must be powerful and spaceless and timeless and purposeful and rational. Why? Because we see that the physical universe demonstrates purpose and coherence. By definition, that can't be the result of some random process devoid of intent. The evidence, whether we like it or not, points to a higher power, a transcendent source of legitimacy. Now, like it or not, we can't just park this. It shouldn't surprise you that this is something that we really need to pay attention to. So let me take you to my story. And this concerns this world centre. And as it comes into focus, I'll tell you the story of an international traveller in the first century whose history is well recorded, and you won't be surprised to find that it's recorded in the New Testament. And he spent quite a bit of time in what's now Turkey, in a city called Ephesus. 
and he tried to encourage and build up a young church there. He spent three months teaching in the synagogue in that city and then eventually in a lecture hall. And he met with success and he met with opposition. And on one occasion, and you can read about this in Acts chapter 19, this individual who, of course, was the famous first century thinker, Paul, he was the focus of a huge riot in the city of Ephesus. And, and when you read the account in, Exeter, in, in, in Acts chapter 19, it talks about how people were sucked into this riot and many of them didn't even know why they were participating. Eventually the mayor came and, and brought calm and Paul moved away ultimately, came to Greece via Macedonia, intended to go to Syria. There was another insurrection against them, a plot against them, and so he diverted back to Macedonia and eventually his intention was to go by sea to Jerusalem and he did set out for Jerusalem and there is Jerusalem. These are the 15th century walls of the old city today. Not quite the same as it looked perhaps in the first century but probably not terribly different in many ways. So let me just try and provide a little of the historical flow to introduce some of the players who fit together in our story. Rome had been expanding its influence in Asia and in the year 63 BC the Roman general Pompey captured the city of Jerusalem and there was a kind of coexistence was manufactured between Pompey and the Roman Senate and Herod the Great who uh, was the governor of Galilee at the time and was appointed by the Roman Senate to be a kind of client king of Judea and he was an, uh, an influential character he grandly reconstructed the temple he enlarged the temple esplanade he he strengthened the supporting walls including the famous Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. There's an image of, this is a picture I took in the National Museum of Israel a few years ago, and that's a, an image of what Herod's temple would have looked like, and that's the Western Wall in the foreground. Now, Herod, that Herod, Herod the Great, the builder, he died in 4 BC. He was succeeded by his son, Herod Archelaus, who was subsequently deposed by the Romans in the, the year 6 AD and replaced by the first in a series of Roman governors or procurators. And it was under the fifth procurator who was Pontius Pilate, the most famous one perhaps, that Jesus of Nazareth was put to death. Now, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, uh, he spent some time with the other disciples, particularly with James. And for reassurance, he offered to participate in a, in a, in a purification ritual involving the temple. Now, unbeknownst to Paul at the time, there were Jews from Asia who had caused all the trouble back in Greece and back in Turkey, what's now Turkey, and they were on his tail and they got together a mob and on the basis of a trumped up series of charges, they caused a riot and ultimately the word got to the Roman authorities and Paul was arrested for his own protection and he was even given the opportunity to defend himself before the crowd. Now, what Paul did was very interesting because, and you can read about this in Acts chapter 22, he, he just gave his story. He spoke about how God called him, how God confronted him. And he took the opportunity of presenting God's rescue plan to the Gentiles. And of course, the Jews were incensed by this. And the Romans finally ordered Paul's uh, punishment initially, but they took him into custody for his own protection. And when Paul claimed Roman citizenship, so a proper hearing was then arranged and there was all sorts of legal argument and it became kind of complicated and wrapped up with the, with the uh, theological issues of the day. And Paul was a dangerous man in the, in the mind of the Jews. He was articulate, he was informed, he was, he was persuasive. But the thing that drove them to a murderous rage was the fact that Paul was responsible for bringing Gentiles into the temple and into the church and encouraged both Gentile and Jewish converts to worship together. There was neither Jew nor Greek. You're all one, he said, in Christ Jesus. And the Jews did not like this one little bit. And there was another plot then emerged to kill Paul. That's Jerusalem that you can see on the Google map there. And there were 40 men who conspired neither to eat nor drink until they had completed their task of assassinating Paul. And eventually Paul's sister's son, his nephew, got word of this plot and he got the word to Paul in prison and the commander Claudius Lysias was informed and decided that to get some justice here he would send Paul to the 
the new Roman governor, one Antonius Felix, who was based in Caesarea Maritima, which is down on the on the coast there. And so Paul was taken by night from Jerusalem uh, in a two-stage journey, initially to Antipatris, and then the following day from there to Caesarea, accompanied by 200 soldiers, 200 spearmen, and 70 mounted troops. And he got to Caesarea, and even in Caesarea today, you can see the remains of the Roman influence uh, at that time. And then not long after Paul arrived there, of course, the Jews were on his tail once again. The high priest Ananias and his legal team arrived and they wanted to present their case. And this was their case. These were the charges against Paul, all of them spurious charges. They said, for example, that Paul was causing unrest among the Jews. Well, there was certainly dissension in the city, but they were the ones causing the unrest. They said he was the leader of a renegade sect referred to as the Nazarenes. Well, he was the leader in a church, one of many leaders, but their goal wasn't rebellion against the government. Far from it. And then they said he tried to desecrate the temple. Well, he was present in the temple, but he was respecting the laws and customs of the temple. And Paul had a chance to make his response. He said, my accusers never found me arguing with anyone in the temple, nor stirring up a riot, nor, nor anything else in the streets of the city. These men cannot prove the things they accuse me of doing. So they waited for the commander to come and while they were waiting for the commander to come uh, Paul had a chance to have a conversation with this individual Felix. Not a very pleasant character by all accounts. And what it says in Acts chapter 24 about that discussion was that Paul spoke to Felix and discussed righteousness and self-control and judgment to come. Some of the big hard realities of life. And uh, when you read about Felix elsewhere, particularly in the writing of some of the other historians, so for example Tacitus has written about Felix and he said he practiced every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of a king with all the instincts of a slave. And Felix actually divorced his wife, married Drusilla, who was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I and the sister of the one who was to become Herod Agrippa II and was to feature also in this tale. So Felix seduced her away from her husband and uh, no wonder Paul was challenging him about righteous living. She was only about 22 years of age when she appeared at Felix's side during Paul's captivity in Caesarea. We don't get much more information in Acts about her life but she did die tragically with her son and daughter in the eruption of Vesuvius when the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were engulfed. But it's very interesting because then Paul has an opportunity to speak with the successor to Felix. This was one Portius Festus, the new Roman procurator. Paul had been left by this time to rot in jail for a couple of years and in Acts chapter 25 he has this opportunity to speak with uh, with Festus and also with their visitors Agrippa II and his sister Bernice. These would be Drusilla's siblings. And uh, they were very keen to hear what Paul had to say. And so Paul was brought forward and once again, brilliantly, he tells his story. This was what he did. But in one sentence, and you, if you wanted to read it, you would find it in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. He says, in one sentence, what are the key elements of the rescue plan that he wanted to pre present to both the Jews and the Gentiles? This was God's rescue plan for mankind. Here are the five elements. Let me just put them up on the screen for you. So first of all, open your eyes. You need to be aware of what's going on here. It's vital that we don't blunder along just putting these hard questions to one side and hope that somehow all will be well, imagining that somehow God's a God of love and so surely won't punish anyone. No, God is a holy, just God who must punish sinfulness. So we need to open our eyes. The second point he said in that verse, to turn from darkness to light. Men love darkness. Jesus taught us. Why? Because their deeds are evil. There's the problem right there. Explicitly, we live with a spiritual battle all around us. And we have freedom to choose which side to take. It's important that we select the side of light and not darkness. And Paul goes on to say, we need to turn from Satan to God. This evil has infected every single one of us. And in so doing, we receive forgiveness. 
And as we receive forgiveness, we are set apart for God. We are eternally secure. Paul, in that sentence, gives a brilliant summary. He wanted to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Now, if you like the theological labels, they're all there. Delivery from the effects of sin, from its penalty, there's justification from its power, there's sanctification from its presence, there's glorification. You get it all right there, and I'll leave some of your own teachers to unpack that in other events. But look at what Paul goes on to say. He says, I preach that they should repent and turn to God, demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This should be a tangible change in their lives. He wasn't saying anything new, but look where it went wrong, because he made a phrase there. He used a phrase that was to bring Festus to his feet, and he said this. He talked about the, how the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Well, that certainly brought Festus to his feet. And Festus was furious and he said, you're out of your mind, Paul. Your great learning is driving you insane. Paul's response, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. It's true. It's empirically adequate. It fits the facts. It's consistent. It's reasonable. It's logical. And it's important. It's experientially relevant to us. If this fact that Paul was so focused on, the resurrection of Christ, did not take place, then the entire Christian edifice crumbles away and it becomes completely hopeless. Why is it important? It's important because, as Paul said elsewhere when he was teaching in Athens, he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man, the same Jesus, whom he has appointed. And he's given proof of this. What's the proof? By raising him from the dead. That was the critical thing. Now, Paul maybe didn't seem like he was in much of a position of power, but he did speak with truthfulness and with authority. See the vital difference? He was in chains. He was bound down. He was in custody. It just makes me think about how Jesus himself spoke about authority. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me, he said. And interestingly, you know, if you're prepared to, to go on side, to turn from darkness to light, to turn from Satan to God and to receive Christ, Listen to the authority you have. This is from Jesus himself in John chapter 1. To all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right, the authority, to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. There's the transcendent right, the legitimacy, the authority right there. You know, in a football game, the players will often tower over the referees. The players are bigger and stronger and more powerful than the older, smaller, maybe out of shape referees. In the game, the players can use their power to knock you down, but the referees can use their authority to put you out of the game. We mustn't confuse power and authority. Satan might be able to knock us down. He has more power than we have, but he has no authority over you if you're a believer. Of course, even Satan knows that, but he doesn't want you to know it. So Satan tries to intimidate you with lies and pressure and deceit into believing that he has authority over you. Well, he does have authority to some extent. There's no doubt about the reality of the spiritual battle in which we find ourselves. Let me just put a few verses up. We don't have time to look at these in any detail, but let me just read a little bit from the Ephesians verse just to give you a sense of this. He talks about Satan here as the prince of the power of the air, or the ruler of the power of the air. You were dead, Paul says to these Ephesian Christians, dead in trespasses and sins in which you lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work amongst those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. So you can see here, Paul describes Satan as the prince 
as the ruler with power because he has authentic power. But when you read the New Testament, you discover that that power is temporary and the power is limited. At the end of Romans, Paul signs off with this phrase, the God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. Now, God hasn't revealed all the details of the spiritual battle, but he has revealed the details of his rescue plan. And it's really important that we are aware of this and that we respond to this and that we turn with our eyes open from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God to receive forgiveness and a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. We read there from, or at least I think it was Beverly who read from Colossians chapter 1. And that section begins with this uh, little bit, just before the bit that she read. It says this, he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, the crucial thing, literally the crucial thing, is the cross of Christ. In Colossians chapter 3 we read, you were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. And then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us, took it away by nailing it to the cross. And look at this verse, verse 15, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. On the cross, Jesus Christ deactivated, dismantled, disarmed Satan's rule over sin and death, gave the ultimate authority to his son and has placed all things in, subject in, in subjection to Jesus. Such an important part of living a victorious Christian life. You can go to all the church services you want, read all the spiritual books you want, do all the Bible studies you want, but you need to experience for yourself. Align yourself by faith under the control of the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, he was headed for Rome. And while in prison there, he wrote several more letters, some included in the New Testament. He wrote Ephesians there, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul lived a life in submission to the authority of God and his word. There's the challenge for us. What about you? What about me? Where will we be when at the last, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow on heaven, on earth, and under the earth? Thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Lewis at this point. Thank you very much, David. Um, it was fascinating, David, there to hear you uh, just sharing with us uh, the true level of detail that the New Testament gives us um, and how we can trust it. Thank you, David, for uh, bringing a few points, which I'll just quote again now. God's rescue plan, it urges us to open our eyes, to turn from darkness to light, to turn from Satan to God, receiving God's forgiveness and gaining a place with those who have been set apart from God. So thank you very much, David, for sharing that message with us tonight. 